talk about four topics uh, this afternoon. One is looking at Great Lakes as a stock market good and service. Uh, secondly, uh, look at the six major economic sectors. Thirdly, trade offs and regulation rules. And finally, climate change and Great Lakes water. Uh, a little bit dangerous for me because I'm following three uh, qualified experts uh, who work on water day to day. Uh, I don't work on water on a day to day basis. I'm not an expert. But uh, as many of you know, that it never stops as a conflict from thinking about anything. Uh, so, uh, so, topic one uh, the Great Lakes is not a market good and service. So, here we have these six sectors uh, municipal, industrial, water uses, commercial navigation, hydroelectric generation, ecosystems. Uh, coastal zone economies and recreational boating and marinas. Um, and the question that I first pose is what do each of these users pay for water? So if you're a city, say you're Milwaukee on the shore of Lake Michigan, um, what do you pay for the water intake that you take from the city of Milwaukee? And who do you pay it to? Um, maybe you are a shipper and you're up on Lake Superior, and you want to raise the level of Lake, Lake Superior by an inch uh, so that you can, uh, you know, have the light of Who do you pay for that? Uh, do you pay the Corps of Engineers, or do they have an account where you put money in and they raise the lake level? Uh, you're over on Georgian Bay, uh, say over on Georgian Bay, uh, you have a second home over there, uh, you want to raise lake level, who do you pay? Do you want to raise that? Not an inch, but three centimeters. Um, you're Canadian, and who do, who do you pay for that? And you know the clear answer to all of these questions really uh, is that you don't pay anyone. And, and uh, water is an unpriced good. And as to everyone in the room, this is natural. This is the way it always has been. It's probably the way it ought to be. But if you're a well-trained economist from Barnard, if you, uh, you've got your PhD at the MIT of Barnard and you come down here and you look at the Great Lakes, the first question they would ask is, you know, what do you pay for water? What do you pay for water? Uh, and so, so we start off with uh, you know, kind of the, the first idea is that um, the markets really do a great job of, of allocating things. They allocate burgers and beer and broths and, and bean sprouts and even tofu. Um, and now we have water, Great Lakes water, and we don't have markets to allocate it. Um, so what do we do and why do we do this? So, you know, the reason that we don't allocate with markets is because really um, water levels in particular and water flows are what we in the economics call pure public goods. And so if you think about, um, say, beach recreation in Dora County in Wisconsin, or a shipper uh, in Gary, Indiana, or your marina over in Saginaw Bay, or maybe you are, again, one of these riparian property owners over in Georgian Bay, um, everyone is operating with the same lake level. Uh, they're really not competing on Lake Michigan and Huron for these lake levels, and that's the, the core characteristic of what we would label a public good. There's really no competition among uh, people in, 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 in the western shore of Lake Michigan and people in Georgia Bay for this lake level. Uh, and so the markets really wouldn't do a good job. So it's, it's I'm not criticizing the lack of markets, but it's really a context for uh, markets allocate goods and services. Well, here we have no markets, 
choices, being prices, and here we don't have that. So instead, you know, we have the IJC, we have these studies, and in some, in some ways, uh, some extent we have benefits to help us make some of these applications. Okay, so the topic two, I want to kind of run through
Presbyterian property and tourism. And so this was a, a, a slide that Drew put up really on uh, some economic activity. So we see the population is concentrated uh, near the lake. And, you know, one thing that I'm going to develop over these next few maps is in looking at the other sectors is that there's really a south to north economy here. Uh, we see the south southern band uh, around Michigan, Huron, Erie, and Ontario, uh, heavy population and much lighter population as we go north. So let's look at that theme a little bit. So beach recreation, and beaches are found uh, throughout the region, but really there, the density of beaches are much higher in the southern tier. We had, you know, I'd like to know whether low lake levels affect beach recreation. I don't know that there's any good data whatsoever or uh, defensible analysis of that. And then if you end up at the beach and the levels are low, have to walk out 50 yards to get to the water. Does that harm your experience? You know, what's the what are the costs associated with low lake levels? Uh, again, I don't think there's a whole lot of evidence on that. So here we put together a few maps of uh, different companies. These are real estate companies and their concentration. Uh, again, we see they're concentrated heavily around urban areas in the southern tier, but then also running around uh, up north on the western side of Lake Michigan, the western, the eastern side of Lake Michigan. And uh, again, so the, there's a concentration of southern in the southern range. I'd like to know whether the low lake levels affect real estate value. Uh, you know, coming out of the application study that said yes, there's a, a, a drop in property values uh, when you have low lake levels. We don't have a good study yet. That's actually the study I'd like to do uh, and try to answer that question. Restaurants, similar. So this is kind of the tourist economy, right? So we have restaurants coming up to the western shore of Lake Michigan in the Shore County, eastern shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, and, but they're not so much up north. So again, this kind of south to north gradient. And hotels, again, another more evidence from uh, the tourism sector, where again, we're coming into the UP with these. But uh, kind of the same pattern, a little bit stronger tends to be uh, in the northern part. Uh, again, it's tourism affected by low lake levels. No answer to that question. I don't know that anyone really knows. Marinas, now there's lots of anecdotes about marinas affecting, uh, about low lake levels affecting marinas. Uh, the pictures kind of cue this up, right? Where you have in the lower right, uh, the last thing of this bridge to nowhere, we have dots to nowhere with low lake levels. Uh, we're at these marinas, and the boats are much lower. All of a sudden, you know, getting into your boat isn't so much important. You have to go down four feet. Uh, and there has to be real damages associated with that. To get to where are these? So what I've highlighted is that, again, there's this kind of north gradient. Uh, Lake Superior doesn't have a lot the way marinas, in contrast to Huron and Michigan, and Lake Superior in terms of house and boat launches. Doesn't have a lot of compared to Michigan and Huron. These maps kind of cue up the same idea. Um, and so, I'm kind of left with this. You know, when I started this exercise, I was really kind of trading off um, sectors versus sectors and thinking that, that sectors were competing with sectors. And when I finished, I really ended up thinking that. Uh, regions are competing with regions, and, and, and the south to north gradient to me is a very strong, uh, really a strong theme. 
nature of the economy. So we move to the third topic where we think about trade offs and regulation plans. Again, this has been uh, queued up by Keith and John. Uh, how to regulate Lake Superior, the key does. And then whether, uh, the same the question that John posed, you know, whether we have to put some sort of uh, what's called a restoration in uh, the St. Snow River. So in terms of regulating Lake Superior, uh, again, we have the boundary water as guidance. We have these orders of precedence, domestic, uh, shipping, hydropower. And we have these these plans. Uh, you know, going through the 1970s, uh, really Lake Superior was only regulated uh, without any attention to the downstream effects on Lake Michigan here. You know, it was really hydropower competing against navigation on Lake Superior. Uh, and I guess you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Regulation plan 1977. So now there is this balancing of Superior and Michigan Huron, where they would their deviation from me would be uh, would be held consistent across the two systems. Uh, we have the regulation plan 1978 going into 1990, and again this proposed for what may become the actual new regulation plan, regulation plan 2012, that's still regulating Lake Superior. And I understand these as, as really kind of tweaking the 1977 plan. You all can correct me if I'm wrong. And in some ways, I think some environmental and ecological flows were built in um, going with 77A in 2012. But there are dramatic changes to uh, regulating Lake Superior. Now, without some sort of Restoration of the St. Clair River. Uh, this work, and I think maybe Drew did this work for the uh, the upper basin, plus the upper basin study. But what this is showing, uh, the dark lines are showing actual lake levels on Lake Superior, and then the simulation with the brown lines of uh, lowering lake levels, or in some cases, raising lake levels on Superior and seeing what the effect is going to be on Michigan here. And I boxed in the simulation here where the levels are dramatically lowering on Lake Superior, but you get very little bounce in Lake Michigan here. Again, this is because the surface area of Lake Michigan here is so large, uh, precipitation from Lake Michigan here Maybe discharge from Lake Michigan here and this part. And so, uh, so you can do what you want to Lake Superior, but it's not going to have much effect on Lake Michigan here. And so, uh, so that was news to me, it was informative to me. Uh, the next question then, and the question that John raised, you know, thought we regulate or, or restore uh, St. Clair River. Here it shows the Denver Basin study proposes maybe a half dozen different ways it might be done. These are some bird stills. These are these turbines, the hydrokinetic turbines that actually would generate some electricity. You can see this turbine field um, in the St. Clair River underwater. And You know, the question that I raise is, I mean, if you had these restoration uh, structures in the St. Cloud River, might you actually, you know, we, when we do the same simulation, when we draw the lake levels on Superior, might we actually raise the lake levels on Lake Michigan here? I think that's the, that's the question that's coming out of this study. And kind of for context for this, um, you know, in terms of throwing out some opinions, my own special judgment is that you know, managing Lake Superior levels for hydropower really seems a poor trade-off. That that if I can if I can move some water 
the goal for Lake Michigan Tech. And, and I, what I'm proposing is that that might stand with like, stand the benefit of the You know, again, that we have the treaty, which puts in, in precedent uh, navigation and hydropower over property, beaches, tourism. Again, we go back to the map, and I really, really can see this area. You know, there, there's some talk about the blue economy as a magnet for people. Um, to me, this is the blue economy, and the IJC and its guidance coming out in April recommends that a benefit cost analysis be done of the, you know, the restoration work in, in the St. Paul River, and I think that's a great idea. I think that that could increase the economic value of this water. Um, we wouldn't show up in any prices, but, uh, but this would be a benefit cost analysis that I'd like to see the results of, that I'd like to work and it's really it's really in some sense uh, expanding the do domain beyond uh, what the treaty would help to accomplish. So lastly, I uh, just want to spend two minutes looking at human migration into the basin. So Alan started this talk with the, the image of the Great Lakes is a magnet, and that people are going to start leaving the south and coming north. And so, I want to show you that some work done by colleagues in the economics department here, uh, David Albui and Ryan Kellogg, um, and a couple other co-authors, did a wonderful study in it's projecting human migration in response to climate change. So, it's looking at a scenario of 2100 and climate change at that point in time and seeing how people are going to reform, people are going to migrate. And the red, orange, and yellow sections lose population. So in the southeast, we're losing population along the California coastline. We're losing population. The Great Basin is losing population. Maybe it will be rapid. The winters are in green and blue and light green. So you see that the northeast coast winds, there's going to be migration or projections of migration to the northeast. The northwest coast winds, there's projections of movement to the northwest. But the Great Lakes winds as well. So their projections are for a roughly 3 million increase in population in these areas shown on this blown up map of the Great Lakes region. And this is 6.5%. Um, and so, you know, this isn't something that just happens in 2100. Um, as climate change goes over the course of the century, and it looks like we're keying that up climate change to occur, this should be a process that will continue, that will, could be starting and will continue for the rest of the century. And the projections from this study are that we would end up with 3, three million. Most of these people are in, most of the increases would be in the urban areas of the southern tier of the Great Lakes Basin. So, just to summarize, uh, the non working nature of Great Lakes water is surely appropriate, but it leads to challenging allocation problems. We need better economic evidence on the impacts of low lake level. I don't think there's anything out there that has done, been done very well. Again, the strong south to north gradient in the economy. I, I question the order of precedence. Coming out of the boundary waters, debating whether that's really anachronistic and whether that is, you know, 
whether we would want to abide by that for a hundred years over the of the treaty was signed. I like the idea of at least thinking about restoration of the St. Paul River. And maybe we're going to have the first migration that's probably from across the town. We'll be going back. So thank you to the Human Water Center for organizing this.